All right. Now, when we, we deal with this issue of Nazism, we always have to be very careful because uh, there's this thing called Godwin's Law that some of you may have heard about, that the longer that a discussion goes on or debate goes on between two people, uh, the more likely it is that Nazism or Hitler is going to get invoked at some point in that discussion. Uh, and so the Nazi uh, and Hitler trope gets overused a lot in uh, popular discourse. And so in the United States, just to give an example of this, uh, it's pretty regular thing for President Trump to get compared to Hitler, for example. In fact, uh, while, the, while the campaign was going on, there was an article that came out when Trump made some comments about uh, Mexican immigrants being, uh, being uh, criminals. And someone uh, actually wrote an, an internet article in which they took a uh, photo that I have in this book here, Hitler's Ethic, that was taken from a Nazi periodical called The Jewish Criminal. Uh, and they took that and they were then comparing Trump's uh, calling these Mexicans criminals to the Nazis calling the Jews criminals and said, you know, it's, it's identical, same kind of thing in there. So uh, I got a call from a Washington Post reporter after that article came out online because of my connection with that picture and everything. Uh, and she was trying to get me to say that Trump was Hitler too. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't bite, and she actually did report accurately what I said, interestingly, which was nice. Uh, but after that, I actually decided to write my own article. So I actually wrote my own article about the issue, too, uh, that <clears throat> came out uh, a couple years ago, or I guess it was about a year. Yeah, I guess two years ago now, something like that. In any case, it's overworked, so we need to be careful. But on the other hand, there are lessons we can learn. So we, we, need, we don't want to you know, just shy away from saying that you can't learn anything about it. In fact, it's pretty remarkable that you know, people have sometimes uh, invoked when I've uh, been analyzing Nazism and the ideological roots of Nazism and such. There are people who sort of invoked Godwin's law on me and said, you know, okay, you know, you're just throwing out dark. Hey, I'm a historian. I'm supposed to be analyzing the roots <laughs> of these things. I'm supposed to be analyzing, you know, what's going on uh, historically. So it seems kind of funny that people would be criticizing me for doing that <laughs> and, and uh, looking at Nazism as one thing. So anyway, having said that with, as a preface, uh, Nazi propaganda is a very interesting uh, case study in uh, the way that a people was won over to a particular position. I want to talk about how that happened in the course of the middle part of the, the 20th century. Uh, and of course it was built in a, a wider context of German thinking and culture and such. And, and interestingly, Germany in the 19th century had been at the pinnacle of uh, scholarship, the academic world, people from all over the world uh, came to Germany to study philosophy, theology, uh, sciences. They had Nobel Prize, you know, they had some of the most Nobel Prize winners coming out of Germany. Uh, they had one of the best uh, educational systems in the world, and yet we see them coming in the middle of the 20th century, and so people say, how could this happen? Why, you know, why, how could this take place? Uh, and <clears throat> So uh, I think we can uh, see a number of things going on here that I'm going to talk about as we talk about the propaganda and the way the Nazis were playing upon these things. But of course, one of the things that happened, of course, was the tremendous pride that developed in the Germans over their education, their knowledge, their learning. And this was going to uh, send them down some wrong paths, I would argue. I don't have time to go into detail on that. Uh, but. Uh, Many of the ideologies and ideas and philosophies that were being developed in the 19th century were uh, ultimately abandoning God, dismissing Christianity, uh, and bringing them into some problematic areas that were going to then uh, become foundational ideas that Nazi propaganda was going to take over. So a lot of the ideas the Nazis were promoting during their uh, time uh, from 1919 when Hitler enters the National Socialist Workers Party, it actually was just called the German Workers Party at that time. He actually helped rename it the following year into the National Socialist German Workers Party uh, until uh, the, their collapse at the end of uh, World War II. Many of the ideas that they're putting forward in their propaganda were ideas that were promoted by some pretty 
uh, significant intellectuals in Germany in the late 19th and on into the early 20th century. In fact, I was just talking uh, earlier about how I got interested in this particular topic. And the way I got interested in the Nazi period well, is sort of a back, came through the back door because when I was in graduate school, I wasn't really interested in doing the Nazis because I thought enough people were already, there's enough stuff being written on, there's all sorts of stuff being written on the Nazis everywhere. You know, everyone's interested in the Nazis. There's all sorts of historians that are already doing that. I'll do something different. So I was, I was more interested in the history of ideas. So I was doing like late 19th century, uh, German intellectual history. My dissertation was on the reception of Darwinism by German socialists in the late 19th century. So I looked at how to chapter on Karl Marx and chapter on Friedrich Engels and Karl Kautsky, Edward Bernstein, other German thinkers. So after I got done with my dissertation, I was working on uh, evolutionary ethics because as I was looking at Darwinism and social Darwinism, I got interested in how uh, many of these Darwinian thinkers were trying to replace Christian ethics with uh, evolutionary ethics. Uh, and so as I got into that topic, I started finding out that a lot of what these uh, intellectuals, biologists, anthropologists, sociologists at the time were saying in the late 19th century did seem eerily close to elements of Nazi ideology. And that's what led me then into thinking about some of the connections of these uh, ideological movements of the late 19th and on into the early 20th century and their connections with Nazis. And that's, in fact, what brought about uh, the book that I actually wrote that came out before, the Hitler's Ethic book, which came out in 2004, a book that I wrote called From Darwin to Hitler, Evolutionary Ethics, Eugenics, and Racism in Germany, which looks at some So there were all these ideas that were being formulated in Germany that were really preparing the way and that were going to be integrated into Nazi propaganda in the course of uh, their the party's uh, and Hitler's uh, career. Now, in the early Nazi propaganda, there were other kinds of elements. Okay, we got this you know, sort of general thing, and I don't have time to go into in detail in that. Again, I've, I've written extensively about it, but I don't have time to go into detail in that today. But there are also other things that early Nazi propaganda was playing upon, in addition to sort of drawing on this fund of ideas that had been uh, created through a lot of German scholars over time. Uh, 1919 is the year after World War I ended, uh, and there's incredible bitterness and resentment on the part of the Germans over having lost that war, especially because they had won on the Eastern Front. They had defeated Russia, uh, and they had signed a very, they'd given Russia a very harsh treaty, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, uh, and they were expecting to win on the Western Front. And the politicians and the generals were all promising they were going to win on the Western Front until very suddenly everything collapsed on them right at the end of the war. I mean, obviously, they had, were stretched way too thin. There was lots of reasons why this took place. But in any case, the German public you know, didn't understand any of what was going on until about September 1918, just a couple of months before they had to sign their armistice, when suddenly everything that they thought they were winning this war, and all of a sudden it, they lost it. So there was incredible bitterness and resentment over having lost the war, and not just over having lost the war, but over the peace terms that they got at the end of the war. Because when they actually signed the armistice, they thought they were going to get much better peace terms than they actually ended up with. President Woodrow Wilson had put forward his 14-point uh, program, which was supposed to uh, bring reconciliation among the nations and things like that. But uh, those 14-point program wasn't very well reflected in the Versailles Treaty that the Germans ended up getting. And so the Germans were very resentful of the treaty that they got. And in fact, if you look at uh, Hitler's early speeches, so from 1919 to 1923, 1919 when he, uh, well, when he first joins the uh, German Workers' Party, up until 1923 when he, goes, when he tries to overthrow the Bavarian government with his beer hall putsch and then gets thrown in jail. One of the main themes of his speeches is the Versailles Treaty. He hammered on the Versailles Treaty because he was trying to play on the wounded resentment and bitterness in the, the German public. <clears throat> There, So there's this notion of Germany being treated unfairly. You know, we've been treated unjustly. Uh, they've, uh, they're pushing us down. They're trying to destroy us, the, the allies, that is, and such. And so that's going to be one key feature, this building on resentment and, and bitterness over the loss of World War I that's going to be a very powerful propaganda weapon uh, in the Nazis' arsenal. Another thing that they were doing at the same time was they were cultivating pride in their racial and national superiority. So uh, 
And of course, sort of the, the other element of that is promising greatness again uh, if uh, the Germans will you know, follow his program and you know, uh, purify themselves either spiritually, culturally, or uh, even biologically in certain kinds of ways in Hitler's vision of things. And so one of the things that gets tied up in that, of course, there's German nationalism that becomes a main feature of a lot of the propaganda as a result of this, but also uh, uh, a notion of racial superiority, okay, that the Aryan race or what can be known as the Nordic race, and by the way, those two, two terms were used, were used uh, in the same way by the Nazis. Nordic and Aryan were basically synonyms. Uh, that the Aryan race was superior to all the other races, so it's playing on people's pride. It's trying to, so they got pride, they've got resentment, and both of those things are going to make a pretty powerful uh, propaganda program uh, for the Nazis. And one element of their racial superiority, of course, was creating a uh, racial minority that is uh, being blamed for the problem. And a lot of the bitterness and resentment then is being focused on this racial minority, the Jews, uh, who are being blamed for losing the war. Because the war was lost so suddenly, after World War I, there were a lot of right-wing nationalists, including General Ludendorff, who was in the army, who was the sec, sort of second in command of the German army, uh, who knew what had happened behind the scenes, but began propagating this notion that we didn't really lose the war. You know, his, and so this idea was being circulated very widely in Germany that the Germans really didn't lose. And so this, again, playing on their pride, you know, we're better, we're superior, we really should have won the war, you know, we got the war stolen from us, you know, kind of thing. I mean, you've seen this in sports events, right? Where, you know, we shouldn't have lost that, we're really better than them, you know. Well, that's the kind of way that this was coming across. And this is called the stab in the back legend. This is the idea that we didn't lose the war. It was some people back home while, while our troops were nobly fighting at the front and would have won the war, there were these people back home, especially these Jews and socialists, back home who undermined the war effort, led peace demonstrations, and overthrew the government, overthrew the Kaiser, and that is what ultimately ended up losing the war. So <clears throat> the Jews get blamed then uh, for losing the war, and in the Nazi propaganda, the Jews were basically the focal point of everything that was negative and everything that was uh, going to be about to try to s destroy Germany. I mean, Hitler really was, and so were many other early Nazis, a true believer in this international Jewish world conspiracy. That the Jews, it, if you've heard of the, uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, it was it, uh, Rosenberg, one of the early Nazi ideologists, was very influential in bringing that to Germany and getting it published in Germany and spreading this idea that the Jews had this international conspiracy where they were trying to destroy Germany. Uh, and destroy other nations as well. Uh, and interestingly, there were, according to Nazi propaganda, and this really seems bizarre uh, when you think about it rationally, but the Jews were being blamed in this international world conspiracy for trying to undermine Germany by two main kinds of ways. One, through capitalism. So here we see the serpent. And the Nazis here are going to strangle the serpent, right? That's, they're they're going to take care of the serpent there. But on the one side, you have Hochfinanz, high finance. Okay, so there's the capitalism. So the capitalists are part of this Jewish world conspiracy. The Jews are greedy. In the, in the Nazi propaganda, the Jews are, are greedy. That's a, a, a stereotype of the Jews that have developed over centuries. So the Jews are greedy. They're part of capitalism. They're representing capitalism. They're oppressing the working class. Uh, remember that the original name of the, uh, not, of the Nazi party was the German Workers Party. So they're standing up against capitalism, supposedly. Although once they came to power, they didn't really do that, but uh, supposedly they're standing up for workers. So the Jews are standing for capitalism, high finance here. But on the belly here, you have Marxism. So you've got sort of these two phases or two prongs of their attack that seem to be contradictory, but really they're, he's blaming the Jews for both of them. You know, so the Jews are the, the capital, they're the greedy capitalists, but they're also the communists. And so uh, that's the two main enemies that the, the Nazis thought that they were fighting early on and directed a lot of their uh, energies and propaganda toward. Now, interestingly, over the course of 
uh, the 1920s and into the early 1930s, before Hitler came to power, there were some interesting shifts that took place in his emphasis on one or the other of these and how these played itself out, and in the Jews in, 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 uh, on the whole as well. Uh, in his earlier phases, he criticized capitalism. In the very earliest phase, he criticized capitalism uh, more than communism. Uh, then later, by the mid to late 1920s, he was and by the early 1930s, he's criticizing uh, communism more than capitalism. And as time went on, in the earliest first er the phase from 1990 to 1920 through, he criticized the Jews continually. That was one of the major themes of his speech. As a matter of fact, the two major themes of his early speeches were the Versailles Treaty and the Jews. Those are the two, his two major themes of his speeches that Hitler gave. But later on in the early 1930s, just before he came to power, uh, he actually toned down a lot of his anti-Semitic rhetoric, not because he changed his views about the Jews, but because it didn't play as well with the German public as he uh, had hoped. Uh, and so instead, he attacked the communists. Now, to the people within his party, the people in the know, they realized that when he was criticizing the communists, he really was criticizing the Jews. They realize that's sort of one and the same, that's part of the Jewish world conspiracy. So once, once you run the mentality, when he says communism, when he's attacking communism, they know that it, that's part of the Jewish conspiracy. But the German public on the whole, uh, who weren't maybe as on board with his intense form of anti-Semitism, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in Germany, but not everyone was that anti-Semitic. And again, the reason he downplayed it was because it didn't play as well uh, with the German public. Uh, so he tones down the, the anti-Semitism uh, while still maintaining his uh, hatred for the Jews behind the scenes to a large degree. <clears throat> now, in addition to giving a lot of speeches early on in the early Nazi propaganda, uh, Hitler also wrote uh, Mein Kampf when he was in prison uh, in 1924 and 1925. It came out in two volumes. And Mein Kampf was going to sort of become the Bible of Nazism, uh, laying out the key ideologies of Nazism. In fact, there's one particular chapter of it uh, called uh, Volk und Rasse, which is also tr usually translated as nation and race, although nation is not a totally good translation of folk. Uh, folk means uh, sort of ethnic identity, your ethnic identity, or national identity, uh, not just uh, nation in the, in the sense of being a, uh, a country. But in any case, uh, in that, that particular chapter, uh, uh, Folk und Rasse was actually uh, published separately in the hundreds of thousands of copies and used in German schools, used with Hitler youth, and such to try to indoctrinate uh, the people in Hitler's racial ideology. And, and some of the key features of that chapter, as well as the rest of Mein Kampf, are biological racism, that is that we, uh, different races have different features, and including different moral features, too. And that's important to understand, too, that the Nazis be believed in biological determinism, that all of our traits are determined biologically, including our moral traits. So if a person is, and here's sort of our stereotype, of the, if the, you look at the stereotype of the Jews being greedy, deceitful, lascivious, you know, the, all these different uh, stereotypes of the Jews, Hitler interpreted those as being biologically innate. Those are hereditary traits. You can't just educate that out of them. You know, you can't just, they can't just change uh, that in any kind of way. So uh, biological racism is central. Social Darwinism, the idea that these different races are in competition with each other. Uh, and that's a competition to the death, ultimately, that's going to uh, play itself out in expansion of those that are uh, superior. So he thinks the superior races, and the Aryan race, of course, he thinks is the superior race. So he thinks they're going to expand and take over the space that other races are now occupying so that they can uh, fill those spaces. And another key feature in Mein Kampf is uh, anti-communism. Now, in addition to laying out you know, the basic ideology of Nazism in Mein Kampf, he also has some instructions on propaganda. So here we're thinking about the media and how they're going to try to present Nazism, because Mein Kampf was written uh, mostly, really, uh, to the party faithful. And really, it's written to people who are in the party, telling them how to uh, conduct themselves. And so here's some of the things that he said about uh, propaganda uh, in Mein Kampf. First of, well, first of all, he, he takes a sort of an anti-intellectual approach to propaganda. Despite the fact that he's laying out a lot of ideas himself in Mein Kampf, uh, 
He says that when you're really focusing on propaganda and winning over the masses, it needs to be anti-intellectual. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to present an intellectual treatise to people. So here's what he said. I'll give you a quotation here. All propaganda must be popular and its intellectual level must be adjusted to the most limited intelligence among those it is addressed to. So dumb it down to the lowest level of the lowest person that you're trying to reach in the population. And then he goes on to say, consequently, the greater the mass it is intended to reach, the lower its purely intellectual level will have to be. Okay, so you're trying to get it down to the lowest intellectual level possible if you're going to reach the masses. And that was one of the key strategies uh, that they used. Another key strategy that he lays out in Mein Kampf is repetition. You know, keep repeating the sa these same simple formulas, these same slogans. You know, keep repeating them again and again until they uh, are inculcated into the public. So here's another quotation from Mein Kampf. In consequence of these facts, all effective propaganda must be limited to a very few points and must harp on these in slogans until the last member of the public understands what you want him to understand by your slogan. And then he went on to say, the chief function of propaganda is to convince the masses whose slowness of understanding needs to be given time in order that they may absorb information. And only constant repetition will finally succeed in imprinting an idea on their mind. So you keep repeating these simple slogans. You know, keep repeating them again and again until finally it gets imprinted on their minds. Now, why, why did Nazi propaganda appeal to so many Germans? Well, I've already explained this to a little extent. You know, some of these ideas of the content of the uh, Nazi propaganda was already fairly mainstream in German society. So if we think about some of the key ideas like scientific racism that I told you, I mean, that was standard anthropology of the time. So here is a, a 1925 map. This is before the Nazi, the Nazis came to power in 1933. So this is before the Nazi uh, period. This is a standard anthropological map of Europe showing you the different racial groupings of Europeans. And the pink is supposed to be the, the Nordic, which would be the Aryan uh, racial type here in northern and central Germany, uh, but also surrounding areas, Scandinavia, of course. So you've got the, the pink representing the, the Aryan race. But then you have these other, even within Europe, a breakdown of the races. It wasn't just one European race either. You know, you got a breakdown of races within uh, Europe. And so you have uh, the East Baltic race, and the Daneric race, and the Eastern race, and the Western race. And so they're dividing Europe even up into different racial types. And then, of course, they're all distinct. And the, you got the, the, the Asiatic, the Mon they call these a the Mongol, I think is what they call them, this, the Mongolian race or Asiatic race, East Asians and such, and the Semitics down here. So you've got these other races outside of Europe uh, as well. Uh, so this was basic biology textbook material. This is basic stuff you learned in school, uh, scientific racism. By the way, not just in Germany. You learn this in other parts of the world too, Britain, United States. United States textbooks were very similar to this kind of stuff with a very similar kind of ideas of scientific racism. So these were kind of mainstream ideas in Germany. Another mainstream idea was nationalism. Nationalism had been a very strong feature in German life throughout the course of the 19th century. And of course, with, the, built with Bismarck's unification of Germany, it was going to sort of bring to fruition some of the movement of nationalism. So nationalism is going to be very, also a very powerful force in Germany that Hitler is going to be able to draw upon. And not only had it been a, been a large force throughout the course of the 19th century, which it was, but World War I had given it even greater impetus. Uh, and Peter Fritsche, I think I've got a... Oh, there we go. Peter Fritsche, in his book, Germans into Nazis, uh, argues that nationalism was really the key thing that won people to the Nazi party during the 1920s and on into the early 1930s. And I think he has a very strong argument that he's making. I mean, there's other elements, too. Uh, so it, it wasn't necessarily anti-Semitism that won people to Nazism. In fact, there actually were people who supported, not, not just a few, people who supported Nazis who weren't even anti-Semitic. But nationalism was a key feature, really, of the vast majority of the people that were going to embrace uh, Nazism. Uh, and part of the, uh, this idea of nationalism also, and this also had been increased by the experience of World War I, was the uh, notion of forging national unity or building what the Germans called Gemeinschaft. 
or community, uh, or uh, comradeship. Those would be good way, ways to sort of translate that term. And in fact, uh, this notion of Gemeinschaft or comradeship is something that had been developed within the trenches of the wars, too. The, the German troops had developed these ideas of, of comradeship as they're fighting together against a common enemy. And in fact, if you read uh, Eric Maria Junger's uh, uh, book, All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, which was a pacifist novel, the one thing that he says that was good that came, I mean, he doesn't say this overtly, of course, it's a novel, but you, see, you have to figure this out. But, but he, the one thing that he portrays as being good about the experience of World War I, I mean, most of it's just horrible, right? I mean, and, and he's trying to portray it as horrible because he's trying to promote pacifism. And he himself fought in the trenches in World War I. But the one thing that he presents as being actually positive is this notion of comradeship that developed within the trenches. And so that's going to be sort of, together with nationalism, these uh, ideas sort of melding together are going to be very powerful uh, ways that the Nazis are able to uh, build uh, uh, loyalty among their people. And the SA, the German stormtroopers, uh, are going to be very often partaking in this, you know, trying to reestablish this notion of comradeship that many of them had experienced during World War I, because many of them had fought in World War I. And so after the war, uh, uh, they come back to German society, and they're longing for that kind of comradeship or fellowship that they had had among the, the troops during the war. And they find that in the SA. They find that in these stormtrooper groups uh, that are formed, the paramilitary forces that are formed in the post-war period. And by the way, the Nazis weren't the only ones that had these paramilitary groups. Uh, the communists had a paramilitary organization. The social democrats had a paramilitary organization. Uh, that was a pretty common feature of post-World War I uh, politics, political uh, Life And in Italy, of course, Mussolini had his black shirts as well. So this was not an unusual a kind of thing, but it was, it was sort of building upon the experiences of World War I in certain kinds of ways as well. There were certain kinds of methods uh, that were very effective also of Nazi propaganda in touching people's emotions. The Nazis were very effective in using mass meetings with speeches by Hitler or other Nazi leaders. And interestingly, at that time, this might seem remarkable to many of us thinking about this, but at that time, when you went to a political speech, you generally had to pay to get in. <laughs> you would have to pay to go hear a political speaker. Okay, so only the best speakers could sort of rise to the top to be able to draw audiences and to, to get people there. Uh, and so people like Hitler who were able to really project and really whip up the, the people, it was very important that they had speakers like that. And, the, and so the Nazis were able to cultivate uh, these speakers who uh, were able to uh, be very effective in rousing the people uh, and, and uh, sort of be, got selected by, you know, if you didn't draw crowds, you wouldn't uh, be able to continue on there. They also had their stormtroopers, whom I already mentioned, the SA, uh, who would advertise for the Nazis. They would march through the streets before the meetings to let people know and try to draw a crowd to the, the meetings that were being held. They would also protect the Nazi meetings because there were a lot of times when there were uh, oppositional figures that might show up, like communist uh, party members who might show up to try to disrupt uh, the meetings. And so the stormtroopers were there to protect those meetings. And sometimes they were also uh, would go to attend communist party meetings to disrupt them themselves. And there were sometimes street battles between uh, these groups as well <coughs> there. And, uh, this is going to project the Nazis as being strong and virile and, and uh, have youthful energy and such. And that was really a, a key draw to many young people, especially when we get into the, the time of the 1930s when you move into the Depression, when a lot of people are unemployed and uh, not able to find jobs. They can uh, find a, a sort of a, a goal or meaning in life through participating in the SA and, and kinds of things like that. The Nazis also, of course, used uh, the press and the media, newspapers in particular, in their rise to power, uh, uh, although uh, really is a spoken word that seems to be more effective uh, for them. And Hitler's mass meetings and such does seem to be really the more effective uh, method of propaganda that they used. Now, once they came to power, they were able to, of course, leverage the uh, instrument of the state to try to uh, use that to uh, promote their propaganda. Obviously, before they came to power, they're having to sort of use their own uh, their own methods, but 
Uh, Joseph Goebbels, in March 1933, became the Minister of Propaganda for the, the Nazis, a new ministry that the Nazis set up that didn't exist under the Weimar Republic before the Nazis. But in March 1933, Joseph Goebbels became the Minister of Propaganda. And he was going to, in September 1933, set up what was called the Reich Chambers of Culture. And the Reich Chambers of Culture were seven different uh, chain, had seven different chambers or subchambers to it. Uh, and in order to be involved in any kind of cultural activity that was covered by these, the chambers of culture, you had to be a member. And of course, in order to become a member, you uh, had to prove that you were a German. You couldn't be a Jew. Jews were not allowed in the chambers of culture. Uh, if you were a social democrat, which was a Marxist party, or a communist, which is another Marxist party, uh, you were not allowed in the chambers of culture. So there's certain people that were then being forced out of positions of influence within areas of culture. And this, the seven chambers uh, were literature. So if you wanted to write any German literature or publish it, you had to be a member of the chamber of culture. And so Jews were no longer allowed to publish. Music, film, Theater, fine arts, radio, and the press. So all journalists had to be members of the, the right chambers of culture as well. And so these were ways that they were trying to, in their view, purge German culture of these uh, Jewish elements and communist elements and other kinds of things that they're combating, of course, during this time. They also were able to take over radio, which was a state-run enterprise in Germany at the time, just like it was in Britain with the BBC uh, at that time. Uh, and the uh, Nazis did something very interesting and clever, too, in relation to using the radio as propaganda. Not only did they take over the state-run radio, and of course they're using it to broadcast Hitler's speeches when he would give speeches, other Nazi propaganda, of course they're playing music and other kinds of things, too, on it, uh, but they also decided to manufacture some very inexpensive radios. And you know one way that you can make a radio very inexpensive? Just have one channel. <laughs> and so they manufactured this, what they called the people's receiver, uh, which they sold very as inexpensively as possible. It had one channel, you could only listen to, you couldn't listen to the BBC on it, uh, because uh, but some, some Germans, of course, would buy radios that did have, you know, could tune, and there you could listen to other outside channels, especially if you're close enough to other countries or whatever. Uh, and uh, so they, all Germany, here's the Fuhrer with the people's receiver, according to the uh, poster here, ex encouraging people to go out and buy the, the people's receiver so they can hear the, the Nazi propaganda and hear Hitler's speeches on the radio. <clears throat> There. So they were very effective in taking over uh, radio during that time. They also, uh, Hitler himself was extremely uh, interested in film. Hitler uh, had his own uh, films, uh, film room, and sex set, a movie room set up in the chancellery uh, and in the, his bunker when he was later in the bunker and everything. Uh, and he would uh, view films almost nightly himself. And you'd see all these, and so he was very interested in film, and so they began also trying to focus on uh, promoting film in, with propaganda. Now, they, now, again, in taking over the film industry, they still, most of the films were just entertaining kind of films. Not all films were propaganda films. Uh, but there were those that they did have that were used for propaganda purposes as well. In fact, the, the racial and political office, uh, the, or racial policy office, uh, made five documentary films in the 1930s uh, promoting eugenics, for example, to try to promote one element of Nazi ideology. Uh, in 1937, they produced a feature film, even, uh, which was called Opfer der Vergangenheit, or Victim of the Past, which was trying to show how this, how people with hereditary illnesses are victims of the hereditary material that's been passed on to them from their ancestors and such. I think I have a shot. Yeah, here's a still shot from Opfer der Vergangenheit. It has an English uh, caption, uh, captions there under this particular one. But uh, in this particular, I think I have a, oh yeah. The commentary in the film, just before showing something like this, this isn't exactly the place in the film, this is they're talking about thousands of drooling imbeciles mostly fed and cared for, so here's a person with a mental disability in an institution uh, in Germany. Uh, one of the elements of commentary in the film says this, which sort of gets at some elements of this eugenics and propaganda, it says, everything in the natural world that is weak for life will ineluctably be destroyed. <laughs> 
In the last few decades, mankind has sinned terribly against this law of natural selection. We haven't just maintained life unworthy of life. We have even allowed it to multiply. The descendants of these sick people look like this, and then they show a picture of a person, something like this. And this isn't exactly the place in the film, but it, they show a, a picture of a, a person with mental disabilities whose uh, face looks a little contorted and such, and to try to give you the idea of you know, the horrors of allowing people with hereditary illnesses to uh, procreate. And of course, the Nazis had already implemented compulsory sterilization by this time, very early on. July 1933, they passed a compulsory sterilization law for people with a variety of uh, hereditary illnesses. Uh, and over the course of the uh, next six years, they were going to compulsory sterilize about three to 400,000 people, which was about one out of every 200 Germans. One out of every 200 Germans was compulsorily sterilized uh, during the Nazi period. That's pretty uh, astonishing. And they had this propaganda to try to back up those kind of views. Of course, in addition to taking over radio and film and media and such, they also controlled the educational system. Most education was state-run in Germany. The universities were all state-run. Uh, most of the primary and secondary schools were state-run. Uh, there were some private schools, but they actually began shutting them down, especially the Catholic private schools. Uh, so they began trying to eliminate any competition to their views uh, in uh, schools. And of course, they used uh, biology especially in history in particular, those two fields especially to promote uh, their propaganda because they were very, uh, because racism, uh, the kind of biological racism and the, the views of the historical development of biological races could be very well integrated into those particular uh, uh, views. So here's a classroom being illustrated in a Nazi uh, journal called Neues Volk. <clears throat> This is a 1934 photo, so very early on in the Nazi period, but it's showing uh, instruction about races. And so you have this boy who's standing here, and they're actually comparing him to these different racial types that are on this uh, poster behind him uh, there. Uh, and so uh, the, they're trying to indoctrinate them, of course, in the Nazi racial ideas. Once again, this kind of thing, by the way, was going on before Nazism, too. This isn't just Nazi. Uh, because again, these kind of racial charts were around before the Nazi uh, period uh, as well. But certainly the Nazis are, are going to enforce this everywhere. They're going to try to make this universal in the, the curriculum there. In fact, they even tried to harness mathematics for Nazi purposes and propaganda purposes. Now, how do you do that? <laughs> well, here's how you do it. The children uh, have to do a word problem. The word problem is, how much does it cost to keep an institutionalized person in a mental hospital for X number of years at X number of dollars per year? And so you're giving people the idea of, you know, uh, again, the eugenics mentality and such. And so even mathematics, uh, where they could, would get harnessed to try to uh, control education. There actually was, at, at the university level, there actually were some Nobel Prize winning physicists who tried to establish Aryan physics. Uh, they claimed that Einsteinian relativity theory and Planck's uh, quantum theory were Jewish physics, and that they were th these guys were uh, experimental physicists. They didn't believe in relativity theory and such. Didn't really, they didn't actually win out, interestingly, in that case, uh, but that's because the Nazis were hoping they could get an atomic bomb, and Heisenberg and Planck and other German physicists convinced them that they could uh, engineer an atomic bomb through uh, using uh, quantum theory and relativity, ideas of relativity. But in any case, there were struggles in, in propaganda in those respects, too, even in the sciences in certain kinds of ways, obviously in biology with the racism. In addition to taking over the educational system, they also set up an, a Hitler Youth program, which became mandatory by the late 1930s. Uh, and which displaced all the other youth programs. So the Protestant church and the Catholic church had very vigorous youth programs before the Nazi period. Those were shut down uh, over the course of the mid, by the mid-1930s. Well, the Protestant was shut down very early on. Uh, the Catholic one in the course of the mid-1930s uh, was closed down so that the Hitler youth uh, would have a uh, monopoly on uh, youth programs for children. And of course, the Hitler Youth, a lot of things they did in the Hitler Youth were innocuous, camping, you know, learning, doing crafts and other kinds of things like that. But of course, they're also teaching Nazi ideology at the same time as they're doing these kinds of uh, things 
uh, as well. Another element of uh, Nazi propaganda that was going to develop in a big way, especially after the Nazis came to power, was the, the cult of Hitler, or the personality cult of Hitler. And so a lot of focus on Hitler personally and exalting him as a hero. And this was not just a German kind of phenomenon. I mean, there were lots of other countries did similar kinds of things with their uh, leaders, especially where they had strong leaders like Mussolini in Italy or like uh, Stalin in uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, there were cults of personality that developed around a lot of these people uh, too. And so you have here a birthday celebration for Hitler. Uh, Hitler's birthday became a national holiday. Uh, in Germany, and so April 20th, there were celebrations all throughout Germany uh, for, on relation to Hitler. There'd be speeches about Hitler. In fact, Goebbels, uh, I think this was on Hitler's birthday when he said this, although I'm not exactly positive of that, but in any case, it, it illustrates the Hitler cult. He gave the speech called Our Hitler, in which Goebbels said this, uh, and listen carefully to this because you'll, you'll find a number of biblical allusions here in this uh, thing that uh, Goebbels said, and this was actually, uh, oh no, actually this one came before 1933, actually. Goebbels wrote this before 1933. It says, when Hitler speaks, all resistance breaks down before the magical effect of his words. One can only be his friend or his enemy. He divides the hot from the cold, but lukewarmness he spits out of his mouth. Many can know even more can organize, but he alone in all Germany today can construct the political values of the future out of the fateful knowledge through the power of the word. Many are called, but few are chosen. We are all unshakably convinced that he is their spokesman and guide. Therefore, we believe in him. You know, so this is laced with religious kind of terminology uh, in exalting Hitler. And in fact, there were actually even some things that were even, even maybe more blasphemous than that in, re in uh, relation to that. Uh, the League of German Girls, which was the, uh, the female branch of the Hitler Youth, uh, that uh, had actually took a form of, or took the Lord's Prayer and altered it uh, to idolize Hitler. And so here's their uh, reflection on uh, Hitler that they put in this thing that they would say sort of in a, a prayerful kind of way. Adolf Hitler, you are our great leader. Your name makes the enemy tremble. Your Third Reich comes. By the way, the, the German is Dein Reich in the Lord's Prayer. The German is Dein Reich komme. You know, your kingdom come. So here it's uh, das Dritte Reich komme, <laughs> you know, the Third Reich come. Uh, your will alone is law upon the earth. So instead of you know your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, oh. your will alone is law on earth. Let us hear daily your voice instead of give us this day our daily bread. You know, give us daily your voice of Hitler, and order us by your leadership. For we will obey to the end, even with our lives. We praise you, Heil Hitler. So that's the kind of way that the cult of Hitler was being uh, promoted among uh, many people. And if you watch propaganda uh, films of Hitler and such, or you see things where they, they show the crowds, I mean, you see it's just incredible the, the way that the people are cheering and, and uh, uh, just so ecstatic you know, about Hitler as this hero figure there. And he does get idolized, as suggested in this prayer, but also here's another interesting uh, way of looking at the way that Hitler got idolized. Before the Nazi period, from the founding of the German uh, Empire, the German Reich, uh, Bismarck's Reich, which was the Second Reich, uh, there was a saying, uh, ein Volk, you know, one people, ein Reich, one empire, Ein Gott, one God. Okay. Under the Nazi period, they transformed that to Ein Volk, Ein Reich, so the same ones, but then Ein Führer. So he took the place of God in this, in this saying uh, that had been 
uh, uh, very prominent among the Germans. This is, this is from a postcard, actually, but you can find this saying on other posters and all sorts of other uh, things in Germany from the pre-Nazi uh, pre period. That, that was a very, very, very common saying, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Gott, a uh, very common motto. Uh, so Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. So one leader, Hitler, there. So there's all these ways that they're uh, deifying Hitler. Now, interestingly, I want to say a little bit about Nazi propaganda about religion, because I think that's very interesting, too. Of course, this, is, this has to do with it somewhat. Uh, but of course, uh, the Nazis were going to try to use religion to their own purposes. And in fact, in Mein Kampf, Hitler actually warned about alienating people on the basis of religion. So Hitler said in Mein well, actually what happened is in Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler is reflecting back on his time in Vienna. There was a very prominent Viennese politician who led the pan-German party in Vienna called Georg von Schönerer. And Schönerer, uh, Hitler said, basically had his ideology right. So Hitler pretty much agreed with his pan-German ideology. But Hitler said his tactics were pretty pathetic. And one of the things that he thought was really bad about Schörner's tactics was that he led a campaign against the Roman Catholic Church. It was called the Los von Rome movement, or Free from Rome movement. And so uh, that alienated a lot of Austrians, and uh, Schörner's political career went in a tailspin. And so Hitler in Mein Kampf warns about alienating people over religion. And so Hitler uh, continually was trying to make sure that he didn't alienate people who might have Christian ideals and such. In fact, the 25-point program of the Nazis actually uh, comes out claiming that the Nazi party supports what they call positive Christianity. Hitler also at times, in April 1922, there's a very famous speech. In fact, you go to atheist websites that talk about Hitler and sort of uh, blame uh, Hitler or claim that Hitler was a Christian and such. There's this April 1922 speech where Hitler talked about how Jesus is his Lord and Savior. He uses the terms Lord and Savior of Jesus. He also says he, Jesus was a fighter, too, by the way, in that same passage. But Jesus is Lord and Savior. Interestingly, he was at that time, by the way, uh, responding to critiques of him by other politicians who were criticizing him for being anti-Christian. So he's saying, no, 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 no. You know, <laughs> Jesus is my Lord and Savior. So uh, what can we make of that? Well, here's another shot showing you Hitler trying to associate with Christianity, or at least try to claim that he's not anti-Christian. This is in 1932. Uh, so while he was campaigning for office, this is before he came to power, uh, he's campaigning uh, in Wilhelmshaven in northern Germany. Uh, and uh, this photo gets taken by his private photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann, and gets published in uh, a book in 1932 called Hitler wie ihn keiner kennt, which means Hitler as no one knows him. And you see uh, the caption of it says, a photographic chance event becomes a symbol. Adolf Hitler, the supposed heretic, leaving the Marina Kirche in Wilhelmshaven. And you see this cross just right above his head, sort of giving him a halo effect. Right? And by the way, it's a chance event. Well, I, I, I wonder if it was staged. Who knows? I don't know if it's staged or not. But anyway, I'm kind of suspicious. It may not have been a quite chance event. Uh, but in any case, it gives Hitler, see, Hitler you know, has God's blessing. This cross is above him. You know, the supposed heretic, so he's not really a heretic. Uh, so, and, he, and you would assume probably he's coming out of a church service, right? He's coming out of this church in Wilhelmshaven. So uh, this is 1932, Hitler's trying to sort of portray himself as being close to Christianity or something like that. However, interestingly, once Hitler came to power and didn't have to uh, sort of play to the sensibilities of people quite as much, he did distance himself more from Christianity. And in fact, if you look at, especially after 1934, Hitler hardly ever publicly makes positive statements about Christianity, although earlier while he campaigning, he had on occasion done that. So, uh, here's an interesting find that I had. This is one of the more spectacular finds I had when I was doing my research on my book, uh, Hitler's Religion. Uh, I discovered that they actually doctored the photo later on in 1938. And I found this by chance, totally by chance. I actually, what happened is I, I got this, I, I got a book. I was just looking for photographs for my book on Hitler's religion. And I, did, I didn't expect to find anything spectacular. I just thought, if I, I'll find some things, you know, it'll be interesting, fit, you know, the story I'm telling or whatever. And so uh, 
I, I, I received Heinrich Hoffmann's 1938 edition of Hitler v. Kainer Kent, which is the, where the, this photo is in. And I thought, that looks a lot like a dust jacket of a book that I have on my shelf. And it's called The Holy Reich. And I pulled the book off my shelf, and it had this photo on it. And I thought, that's interesting. You know, where's the cross over here? And I wasn't even sure at first which was the authentic, which was the original, and which was the fake. Uh, I wasn't sure if they'd actually uh, added that, because it looks kind of weird the way they have it so bright, the colored right there above him there, when everything else is so dark. I, I wasn't sure if they added that there, or if they took it out here. I didn't know what, what had happened there. So I wrote to the Heinrich Hoffmann archives, which still has Heinrich Hoffmann's photographs. And in fact, I found out they actually have the negatives of this still in Munich. Uh, at the Heinrich Hoffmann archives. And the ar I haven't looked at it myself, but the archivist assured me that the cross is in the negative. Uh, and so apparently this is the original. It was originally shot like that. And so that's on the negative there. So they airbrushed away. And in fact, I had a photography friend of mine later on examine this one, had blow it up really a lot. And he said, you can see where they airbrushed it out, uh, the, the cross out of there. So by 1938, Hitler doesn't have to worry as much about the Christian. Uh, connecting with Christianity as much. And so, you know, he removes this context. And not only do they uh, change the picture, but of course they have to change the caption because the caption wouldn't make sense uh, in this, with this new picture. So here's the new caption. Adolf Hitler after sightseeing at the historic Marina Kirche in Wilhelmshaven. So making very clear he's not attending a church service, folks. You know, he's just sightseeing at this piece of architecture there uh, in Wilhelmshaven. So, <clears throat> Hitler then uh, you know, distances himself a little bit uh, from Christianity at that time. And after coming to power, uh, this is going to be uh, uh, a common feature. However, there were a lot of Germans who uh, were st did st feel, still feel some affiliations with uh, Protestantism. And by the way, I, I deal extensively with this issue in my book, Hitler's Religion. Uh, I could talk about it for hours, but I don't have time here to do this. Uh, but uh, Hitler himself was estranged from Catholicism and Christianity from a very young age. It's very clear. Uh, even from the time he got confirmed, it's clear that he really had a lot of contempt for Christianity. He never attended a church service in his life after uh, childhood, except for funerals and uh, uh, weddings and things like that. And even one funeral he attended, after he attended at Goebbels recorded in his diary that Hitler was mocking the funeral mass and everything that he'd just uh, been to. So Hitler didn't really have any uh, personal uh, ties to Christianity. And, and privately, he criticized it uh, very heavily, very often. But there were other Germans who wanted to sort of uh, uh, put the two things together, Nazism and Christianity. So there were a lot of churches who put up Nazi flags in their churches and decked out their churches in Nazi flags. There were uh, SA troops who were attending church uh, in, in groups here. So here you see them coming out of a, a church service and such. Here they're at a church service with the SA uh, there. There was a movement within the Protestant church called the German Christian Movement, which is basically a Nazified form of, of Protestant liberal Christianity. Uh, and here's a shot of them with their flag in which they have a cross with a swastika in the middle. Uh, this is marching uh, through Berlin. Interestingly, by the way, the Nazis later on forbade the German Christian use, movement from using the swastika. Uh, and so they, they uh, again, try to distance, <laughs> putting distance between them and Christianity a little bit later. And they also later on forbade the SA to attend church services in uniform. Uh, they could still attend church. They were allowed to do that, but they weren't allowed to go in their, their Nazi uniforms there. Uh, after coming to power, Hitler tried to control the churches in certain ways. He signed a concordat with the Vatican, which was a, an agreement whereby Hitler would allow them to appoint their own leaders, to have their youth organizations, to run their schools, uh, as long as they would acknowledge that he was the legitimate ruler of Germany. Uh, and that was signed by the Vatican. Uh, Hitler uh, continually violated it throughout the 1930s, and even by the late 1930s was jailing priests and such. Uh, in 1933, he also tried to influence, and did influence, the, the church elections in the Protestant church. The Protestant church in July 1933 held church elections for their synods, uh, and SA troops were standing outside the polling place. Here's some SA guys telling you, uh, choose list one, the Deutsche Christen, the German Christian movement, uh, which was the Nazified form of the Protestants. Uh, in those church elections. Hitler actually gave a radio address, even though he was technically Catholic. He gave a radio address telling people who to vote for in the Protestant church elections. Uh, 
just before this. And the German Christians won a big majority of this, at that synod and were able to get uh, their church leadership put in positions of power and influence at that point. Uh, Hitler also began uh, trying to whittle away at church influence at various kinds of ways uh, throughout the 1930s. Here's just a propaganda poster telling people uh, Adolf Hitler's youth go to public school. What that means is they don't go to parochial school. They don't go to Catholic school, which was one of the most, most of the private schools in Germany were Catholic during that period. So it's telling, and later on they were actually going to out and out close most of those parochial schools. Uh, which was a clear violation of the Concordat, uh, but the Nazis just ignored the Concordat whenever it didn't suit them there. As I suggested, they also began waging a press campaign. So here we go over the media again. They began waging a press campaign against Catholic priests, accusing them of all sorts of sexual infidelities, of money laundering, of all sorts of other kinds of things, some of which were true, but mostly were not, uh, and trying to whip up the German public against uh, the churches. <clears throat> in all sorts of ways. They also ended up jailing a lot of confessing church uh, pastors and Catholic priests as well. Okay, so what lessons can we draw? I need to sort of draw some conclusions so we can have some time for discussion and question and answer here. So what kind of lessons can we draw from this use of uh, Nazi propaganda and with not just in the religious sphere but in, in, on the whole? Well, first of all, it strikes me, and especially in the work that I've done in looking at sort of the long uh, the ideological underpinnings of Nazism, we need to confront bad ideas long before they come to political power. I mean, there's, there's uh, you know, culture is upstream from politics. Culture is going to influence, the culture today, how it's being shaped, is going to influence the politics of tomorrow. And so we need to, if we're thinking about politics, we need to be concerned about culture. In fact, I just read an article just, uh, I think it was just a couple days ago, uh, by someone uh, concerned about the United States situation. They were talking about the history textbooks in the United States and the kinds of things that are being taught to people in the United States and their history textbooks and how uh, they're, they're going to be influencing the politics of the future and already are influencing it to some degree uh, as well. And I think that's really true. We need to pay attention to the ideas, ideologies, and culture uh, because that's going to uh, affect the political situation down the road. We also need to beware of emotional appeals, which is one of the big things that the Nazis were strong on. The appeal to the emotions with these slogans, and especially emotional appeals to pride, that was one of the big things that the Nazis played upon, German pride. We're the best. We're superior. We're the Aryan race. We're better than all the other races. Uh, and so you know, we should be able to dominate, expand, you know, force out these other people and such. And also resentment, playing upon resentment, the, the woundedness of the, the German people at the time. So we need to be careful of those kinds of uh, propaganda that f sort of focuses on trying to channel people's resentment and pride in various ways. And then also, sort of finally, dealing with the religious aspect that I just talked about too, uh, obviously we need to be very wary of religious claims being made by politicians uh, trying to uh, gain power. Um, you know, Hitler was making claims about Jesus being his Lord and Savior publicly. On the other hand, privately, he was saying something quite different. In fact, in 1924, in, when he was in Landsberg prison, uh, Rudolf Hess, one of his closest associates, I was talking with Hitler about religion, and Hitler told Hess point blank that I'm, a, I'm playing the religious hypocrite to the German people, you know, because I as it is a tactic. It was a political tactic to do it. So we need to be aware of religious claims by politicians trying to gain power.